Oh, what is up, everybody? It looks like I'm cutting my head off. Hold on. Let me get this straightened out. <clears throat> How's that? So, this is officially a popper update. This is number 20. Noble gas engine, popper. All right. As you can see right there, I got the coils on the device. I'll tell you why it took so long. Um, I'm going to try to not make this extremely long. I have been waiting to make an update for a couple of reasons. Um, one of which is very exciting. I'm only going to give you half of the details, and that is because I don't have the other half. Alright, so when I get the other half, a whole nother awesome thing is happening. Um, so that is where we're going to start. The first thing I'm going to show you is this right here. Alright, so those of you who have been paying attention, I built this quick timer circuit so that we could easily replicate constant firing of the popper kit, the popper device, not the kit, but the popper device here. And, well, cool things have happened. Um, there's been an individual by the name of Tim. For now, we're going to just call him Tim. He's got a last name. He said I could tell everybody his last name, but I'll wait just a little bit longer. Uh, so, Tim, a little bit longer. I'll shoot you out there. I don't want you to get flooded. Anyway, this individual has um, offered to help. Okay, Thus far right now, what he has sent me is a pressure transducer. Okay, This here is a, um, a shunt. almost lost my train of thought there. If you guys don't know what a shunt is, it's basically a device that you can hook up a very big load across take a slight measurement reading across the voltage drop on these other pieces and you get an accurate reading of high power levels. So we've, we've got a shunt and a pressure, pressure transducer. I'll give you the make and model of this. Um, I'll actually be testing this today. This is what I'm going to be doing today. I'm going to be testing this pressure transducer and I'm also going to be testing this awesome board that his son Brian put together and Tim has programmed. Um, luckily, the cool thing about this is this is a programmable PLC controller. I can do PLCs, I can control ladder logic, I can do that stuff. I do that on a daily basis. This also has scripting in, in it. Okay, This particular controller has scripting. So what he's done is he's created um, a program that uses slight ladder logic and the rest is scripting. So I have to learn the scripting logic a little bit better, but I do understand it and I know how to manipulate it, so I'm good for now. Um, but this is basically our new controller. This replaces this PAP timer. Now the cool thing about this is that Tim is everything he is doing, he is doing freely and open. He is sharing all of his resources and knowledge with me to share it with everyone else. That's you. Alright? So just leave Tim a big thank you in the comment. Once you get part two of why all this is important, I'll give you a hint. Okay, pressure transducer, way to measure amperage and voltage. Just keep that in mind for part number two. Alright, but this is where we're going to start today. So, this is a tri uh what is it, tri... Oh, it's all scratched up. It's a, if you look at, if you Google it, you'll find Super PLC. Try something. T R I. Just Google Super PLC, you'll find it. Try Logics, I think it's called. Eh, I don't know. Lost my mind. Anyway, the, the, the cool thing about this is everything I'm doing, if you wanted to go buy this, you, you can probably purchase this still. This isn't brand new technology, it's actually fairly fairly old technology, so you should be able to find these online for pretty pretty cheap. I actually haven't looked them up. But the programming for all this will be freely dispersed. Um, everything will be able to be replicated. This whole board, I actually don't have a schematic on this, but it's straightforward. We have some optical isolated output relays so that we don't blow up the board. And uh, these are run, run, repeat, stop, and fire. Basically, I'm going to be doubling these up with my control panel that I already have. And I'll probably end up using this. This will just be an isolated control board. I'll be placing somewhere else on the table, okay? But the cool thing about this is this controller is actually amazing. 
Um, it's pretty straightforward, very simple, but I'll actually be able to hook up an encoder to this and actually use this for the rotary engine, okay? Not the, not the rotary uh, vane engine, but I'm talking about a double piston. Um, I can attract the, encode the actual position of the shaft, and this has enough input and outputs to actually do everything that we should be able to do with a two version um, piston type of setup, okay? Very straightforward, very simple. Now the reason that he used scripting is because we're going to have separate software to actually be able to control this from a computer. Uh, right now I have to manually change everything and then download the program. Not a big deal, for now it works out perfect. But we've got enough outputs to do the coils, the RF, the high frequency, and also modulate the incoming pulse, which is what I've been trying to explain to people I want to do. Um, I want to be able to shoot this very short pulse duration of high capacitor discharge through there, but I want it only let's say for 10 milliseconds. Um, it's very similar to what Heinz is doing. Um, Heinz is actually using an IGBT to fire his capacitors along with high voltage. I will be trying that. I want to find out if that's positive or negative, a good thing, a bad thing. Is it worth it? We don't know. We will find out. So it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. Um, today's the first day I actually be able to get out in the lab and do anything. Um, the first thing I'm going to be doing is hooking up this pressure transducer. Okay, and actually I'm probably going to go ahead and hook up this circuit and get it all working. You might as well. It won't take long. Um, I've got extra outputs and inputs that I can hook up here and just double up all the switches. Hook it right up to my other box here. We're good to go. And then I'm going to be testing this pressure transducer. Now, there's a couple things um, that I have to kind of explain so that everybody understands what I'm thinking here. Alright, I've done enough research um, to actually, I'm actually starting to wonder if inside this chamber we're creating a, a plasmoid in a toroidal shape, if we're actually doing that. If we are, there's going to be a problem with measuring the pressure in the chamber. That's my opinion. Um, we'll find out, actually. But for now, we're just going to do the pressure, because that's all I got on hand. I want to see if it maxes out on 100 PSI. That way we need to know if we need to get a higher rated pressure transducer or if this one's going to work. So these are just the initial tests. I'm just going to be using my oscilloscope. It's a 0 to 5 volt output and I'll be able to track that and find out if it peaks out or not. Okay. If it goes above 5 volt, we know we've done over 100 PSI. I have a feeling we're going to be over that, but I'm not for sure. Now here's the problem with using a pressure transducer in the side of the chamber. Okay, This is going to be mounted right here in the side of the chamber. I really have this feeling that if we're creating a plasmoid in a donut shape and we're forcing it straight up against the piston, then all the pressure is actually this way. Um, I don't remember the um, institution, but one of the colleges was playing around with plasmoids and they're allowed, they're, they're able to shoot a um, vortex ring plasmoid out in, in midair using air, okay? If that's the case, and also if you get, if you've ever seen a smoke ring, um, machine where you can fill it up with smoke and hit the back of it and the smoke ring will just go really really far. There's no pressure over here it's all a forward pressure, it's all a directional pressure. There's also a video I just found online of this giant steam powered vortex shooter that shoots a ring out of it. It sounds like a jet engine going past, okay? If we're building and, and if we're doing something inside this chamber like that then it's actually going to be forcing in one direction. So if I'm reading pressure over here and we're having a directional force once that force hits the piston, yeah, it'll disperse a little. But I don't think that is going to be accurate, okay? I just don't. Now, I, I do plan on adding a load cell. I have a couple of different load cells that we should be able to get some measurements for now. Um, and compare, once we get a little bit further in this, you'll know a little bit, understand how I'm going to do that. But right now, we're going to try a pressure transducer and then compare it to the pressure that we're getting on a force gauge and then we'll know whether or not that that is true. So I'm having concerns about measuring it from the side with a pressure transducer. I don't know if it's going to give us accurate readings because of this toroidal shaped plasmoid field that you're pushing um, and the way the chamber is designed that you're creating it and it's going upward okay just like a, uh, a plasma shock tube you know, you're having a traveling wave in one direction. It may not travel in all directions equally. I don't know. It may all depend on the electroid setup, the the way the elect uh 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 yep yeah, uh thingamabobbers here, the uh um 
yeah, electrodes, there we go. Depending on how the electrodes are set up, you'll get a different shape of plasmoid and a different shape of that moving plasma. Um, so anyway, there's my quick thoughts. I know that probably took a while. But that is what's going on. So today I'm going to do pressure testing. I will videotape all this. It will be on this video, number 21, update number 21. And we'll be hooking up this. Now, um, today is the, I believe it's the 12th. It's actually Sunday night right now. It's 1.30 in the morning on May 13th. 1.30 a.m. May 13th. Just had Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to you all. I know there's a lot of guys that watch this, but for the women that do. And guys, if you missed it, yesterday was Mother's Day. You better go tell her. Anyway, uh, all right. Well, that's it. Let's get started. That's all I got for you. Oh, I will show you the coils. Um, I wasn't going to take these off. But I'm going to go ahead and take these out. I, I, I'm going to explain to you why that I, I didn't test these coils yet. I was a little afraid, to be honest, to test these coils because I had to machine a tiny bit of material out from the inside of these in order to make them clear the bolts. So I was just didn't do it yet, but I, I did finally get to it. There we go. All right. So, I'm probably just going to be using one coil for now. But you can see I, I cut notches out on the inside of here. See the four notches? All right, right here. See the divot? And the reason I did that is because I couldn't get them in here. Uh, it was so close that it was just too close. So I actually took a, an end mill and milled straight down the edge of there and I didn't clip any copper. Oh, that was kind of tedious and a little bit stressful because if I clipped copper, the whole thing's shot. I did it, I managed to do it, so now we'll be testing with coils and the controller will do coils, RF, everything. I got enough outputs. I got eight outputs, two of, width, two of which are pulse width modulated. This controller is really cool. It's got a lot of options on it, so we'll be able to do a lot of different things. Um, so that's it. Let's get started testing the pressure transducer. We'll try it with air. We'll try it with helium. We'll try it with... Um, I've got argon. If i got time, I'll do argon and also hydrogen. Okay, we're going to try all of those to find out the different pressures. Now, if I peek it out on air, I'm not even going to try the rest of them because we're going to have to wait to get a higher version pressure transducer. Um, I am going to go ahead and hook up the circuit the way I used to have it to where the high voltage arcs across the electrodes um, using the transformer here and the spark gap. I'm going to go ahead and hook it up that way. And the reason is um, I've been wanting to add this into this video too. I wanted to explain something I figured out. Okay, I'm having a problem right now. I'm going to show you what the problem is. This is the tungsten. These two are the tungsten. These are titanium. It's just because I had them laying around. Might as well use them. Now, there's a couple things I want to explain really quickly. Pat videos are always long updated videos. Sorry, but you want details? I've got to share everything I can. I think by using the ignition coils versus the high voltage transformer, when, when you use the neon sign transformer, okay, and you create an oscillating R RLC circuit, okay, which is the capacitors, the spark gap, and the coils. When you create an oscillating circuit, you can get into a very high frequency. I'm pretty sure I'm getting into a very high frequency in the RF range. Okay, I did use an oscilloscope to try to check this, but it's a it's just a messed up signal. I can't even hardly see what the frequency is because I don't have some of the right probes to measure it accurately. But when I use the ignition coil and when I use the other coils, um, it seems like it's a different reaction. It seems like one's more powerful than the other. And I'm really thinking it's because we're pre-ionizing the internal gases with the high voltage arc and the RF all within one bundle. All right. So if you can calculate it out, if you can take a neon sign transformer and the right capacitors and the right spark gap, you can oscillate that at the exact frequency of which we think would be a good one, which right now would be 27.12 megahertz. If we can calculate it out to, free, uh, to oscillate that way, we don't need a radio frequency generator. We have it built into the system. That is why I'm leaning more towards using the neon sign transformer. Um, 
The other type of circuit that I have hooked up, which is cross crossing the high voltage, let me show you what I found out. So this is real interesting. Um, if you look closely, you'll see that I'm getting a mess. I'm getting a giant mess on here and here, which are the, the titanium rods, the ones on the sides. Okay, The tungsten actually don't look real bad. That one looks kind of iffy. That one looks really, really good. So here's the problem. When you throw an arc across this way, okay, whenever this discharges, it's like it's spread out, and it actually, I've never seen this, it actually throws material out at an angle, okay, left and right. But it does it really, really bad. Not just a little, but every time it throws stuff really far. Not good. I'll, I'll do some demonstrations of that and show you what I mean. But when you throw the arc across the electrodes which you're discharging, it's like something else happens and you don't get that, that reaction. It's a different type of reaction. So my thing is, is I want to find out what, what's going on with that. I want to find out if it's better or worse to do either or, but I'm really thinking it's better to throw it across the same electrodes. All right. Now, that's just what I'm finding out from some testing. I haven't validated anything yet. And now that we'll be able to measure a few things, I'll be able to validate some stuff. Um, right now, I'm just going to be testing the electronics and the pressure transducer today. If I get to that, I'll be happy. And the reason is, is that tonight I'm also going to be blowing up some of these um, really fancy old um, contactor relays with the switchboard and the capacitor bank over there. For those of you who uh, didn't watch the other video, I purchased myself a milling machine, okay? And I did that with uh, scrap price money. That was scrap. I uh, purchased it for scrap. It works perfectly. I bought it from work, and they're just getting rid of it. So I got myself a milling machine. I'm really excited about that, because now I can actually do stuff that I really want to be able to do right here in my garage. So, cool. Um, so that's it. Let's go ahead and do these tests, and then I will uh, we'll show the results. All right. So looking forward to it. Don't forget to leave Tim a comment and uh, give him your thank you. You'll see why this uh, when this uh, next step happens, you'll be really amazed at what we're going to be doing. I'm super excited about it. Good things take time, so we got to wait for good things to happen. All right, let's get started. Alrighty guys, so here I am testing this transducer. I wanted to know what it looked like when it went off scale. And it just pegs out, it just goes to a dead um, stop. So let me show you what it is. I got it uh, connected to 24 volts. That's what it is to run. I think it'll go down lower, but that's what I got it to. Then I've also got the regular pump that we've got hooked up here. So let me get the camera set up. And you can watch both of the pressures. Yeah, that's good enough. Alright, here we go. You'll see it rise out of the screen there in a second. Here it comes. And there it's just pegged out. So if we let it drop real slow here, let's see, I should be able to release a little air out of this side. Don't throw everything on the ground first. Whoa. Alright, let's pump it up again. Try to release it a little low, slower here. Right there, it started moving. About 114, it starts registering. Now uh, we're just off scale here. So, show you it on a higher scale, the 2 volt scale to 1 to 5 volt sensor.
and pegged out. So there you go. Now you know. Now let's hook the rest of this thing up and do some real testing. See if we peg 100, about 114, 113 PSI. Alrighty guys. I decided to measure vacuum. Let's see if that works. So, I mean, it's got a vacuum now. Let me show you what it looks like. So that's under pressure right there. Okay, I'm gonna stop it and I'll put it under vacuum. So there's about. Closer to zero, about five or six psi, and <clears throat> pulling down the piston right there on the flat spot. Now we're pulling a vacuum. So interestingly, the gauge works, but I don't know how accurate it is under a vacuum. But it seems pretty steady. I don't think we're damaging it by pulling a vacuum. So I just wanted to show you that it does work under a vacuum. Cool. It's a good deal because it's not really rated for it. It's rated for positive pressure, but it doesn't say you can't hook it up to negative pressure. All right, there you go. Well, um, it broke. Yep. It lasted for a little bit, and then it stopped working altogether. I think we've killed it. That really sucks. Let me show you on the scope. I didn't record anything, uh, but we got about, uh, let's see, 260 millivolts on a signal, so we can use that reference as how much pressure. I'm currently only using two capacitors for now. I just wanted to test that out and see what it did. And we have lost our signal. It did shut off my scope many of times and um, now it's dead. I can't get it to read anything at all. So it looks like the RF um, signals coming off of this stuff and the EMP pulse and everything else is not good on sensors which is something we needed to test and we did so I guess I'm back to square one I'm gonna go ahead and uh, see what else I can do here oh if you guys uh, you guys didn't see I did manage to uh, get one of these exploded there's the contactor I did take some of it apart it didn't blow up that bad but it blew up pretty good so you might want to watch my other demonstration of the 10,000 joule capacitor bank discharge over a contactor. That's another video. Go watch it. Anyway, uh, yeah. I guess that's all I got. I'm going to go ahead and uh, see what time it is. I might start hooking up the controls and uh, we might play around with that. But it looks like pressure transducer didn't make it. Kind of sad. Bah. Got chips in my teeth. Alright. So here's what I did. <clears throat> I went ahead and hooked up the new circuit timer circuit and controls works really well I only currently have the high voltage and the charging circuit connected so I'm going to show you kind of how this works alright for now I'm going to go ahead and use these switches I do have it doubled up to these switches but this is all like manual override this is all automatic so that's how I'm doing this override automatic um, <clears throat> so here I can control charge and fire. Okay, and this also kills the charge circuit. I still need to add my safety resistor. I need to do that. Uh, okay, so that's how that works. This portion of it is the auto fire. Okay, so it's automatically firing. All right. Now, if I flip this switch, this is the stop. This is the repeat or auto. So now it will just continue to run. Okay, now if we wanted to watch it, monitor it, and see what's happening, I can do that. Okay. If you want to see the rest of it here. Oh, that's the wrong mouse. 
there's the wrong program. Inside this wrong program, here, let's stop it. It'll automatically stop if you turn off auto after the last cycle. Let's look at the, the wrong program real quick. Basically, it's just a um, first scan to initialize every time. And you got to start and stop wrong, just like a normal, re normal wrong. Internal relay, an internal relay, and a clock. <clears throat> every point, oh, one second. <clears throat> so every one millisecond, it repeats the cycle and it checks for timing. That's how we're actually timing. Works really well that way. So we have millisecond timing increments. If I open this, this is my control. So I've got voltage, um, and the, don't worry about the labeling yet. I need to relabel some stuff more accurate. But let's go ahead and change the timing. The high volts on. Let's only do 20, so that's 0.2 of a second. Let's go ahead. Oh, that's high volts. Hold on, charging. Charging. It was at 50 milliseconds. Let's do 20 milliseconds. And then high voltage is on at 25. That gives me 5 mil point, point 0.05 milliseconds to turn off the contactor. And then let's turn on the high voltage for just a very short duration. Change our total time. And now, when we fire this, it will happen very rapidly. So I can do this manually. I can also control it from here. Okay, I believe that that changed that. It may not have downloaded. It should have. Yeah, should have saved it. Let's go. So, again, I can do re auto. may need to download it. Anyway, see if we can get it going faster. Okay. I think I had to download it. <clears throat> I don't know how to do it automatically yet. We will have that option, but right now it didn't work for me. So here's one cycle. So let's do it fast. Oh, too fast, huh? Reset. I need to slow it down a little bit. Alright, we'll slow it down a little bit. A little bit too fast for me. Mm. Still pulling too much. <laughs> but it's working. I need to control my incoming amperage a little bit. Alrighty, enough playing around for now. About a half a second cycles. Finally killed it. <clears throat> Reset. I don't have but just two capacitors on here, so we'll turn down the amperage a little bit. Anyway, just so I'd show you that it works. Now we can hook up the coils as well and play with the timing. Um, I'm going to have to add external stuff for that. I don't have that yet. But I'll be able to switch polarity with two different outputs. That way we can control the polarity of the coils. So 
So there you go. Um, really quickly, I wanted to explain something with you on these coils. A couple of thoughts. Um, <clears throat> really enjoyed uh, Bob's videos and his demonstrations on uh, Smart Scarecrow Show. Some little hints here and there. I was thinking about these coils and uh, the collapsing magnetic field is maybe the most important part not the fact that there is a magnetic field but the collapsing magnetic field when you get that high voltage spike out of that coil when it when that when you when you take power off this coil it's going to throw you a high voltage spike in the opposite polarity and i wonder if that high voltage spike if timed exactly at the right time will actually help the process so that collapsing magnetic field is actually might be a boost and the high voltage sp spike output either gets fed to the other cylinder or can be actually used to fire this um, system okay just some thoughts some stuff I've been thinking about but kind of interesting um, I guess that's about it oh I did want to show you one more thing I forgot to show you this check this out I told you my dad brings me stuff I got a new shield. Ready? Come and get it. It's a little heavy. I have to build a frame for it. Ah, how's this? Ah. All right. It's got a little bit of a tent to it. Okay. I'll show you how this thing is. All right. That might be my new blast shield. It came out of a bank. Yeah, a bank. Um, it's the inside door of the actual bank. Right behind the main locked door was this. Okay. This is a half inch piece of some sort of really hard plastic. I really have no idea if it's bulletproof or shatters. I don't know but it should stop an object at least slow it down right it had a door on it you can see that it got bent while opening it I've also got the hinges right here that actually go on it it's actually a door so there's two hinges alright on the edge plate here so I don't think I'm gonna use it maybe somebody can find some information about it Molesler Hamilton it has a date code 485. It's old as I was. If that's the right date. 85. I don't know. Anyway, um, kind of cool. It's got the little latch on it. Check out this key. It's kind of cool. It's like a like a hand cut key or something. It doesn't turn because this is all bent up. But it's kind of cool. Anyway, I figured this would be a nice new blast shield. I've had this actually since the last updates, but I forgot to film it. I almost forgot it again. So, yeah, if that isn't good enough, I don't know what else that can be to help us. So, I guess that's all I got for you. Um, I really don't have anything else to say, I guess. Um, just be patient, and uh, good things are happening very slowly. Hopefully we can get some more information on this popper and learn a little bit and be a little bit safer at the same time. So that's it. Russ is my name. RRW is your research is my website. Really, really appreciate all the support. Um, it's always good to have positive feedback and uh, that's all I got for you. It's been a long day and uh, now it's time to go finish some other videos. I'm going to blow up some more contactors. <laughs> Looking forward to that. Peace and love to you all and look forward to the next update. See ya. Ah, the ending of PAP Update 21. I forgot to add something. I wanted to discuss something with you really quickly. So, um, first thing is, I did not... I said in the video I was going to connect the circuit this way, like a 90 degree, or back to the original cross, high voltage, single pair of electrodes. I did not do that just for the simple setup. I just went ahead and set up the way I had it. Just for reference, if you wanted to know about how I had stuff hooked up, the other thing is, uh, I didn't really specify the um, pressure transducer and kind of what happened there. Basically, we are so close to this reaction that those 
electronics are so sensitive that you'll just knock them out. Uh, so Tim uh, came up with a fairly decent solution. Uh, I think this will work well. What we're going to do, um, I am going to take some sort of uh, hydraulic line and put the pressure transducer 5-10 feet away from the unit. Fill the entire length of the um, line with hydraulic fluid, okay? And then on the end where I'm inserting it into the chamber, I'm going to have some sort of a rubber diaphragm so that we're still getting the air pressure here and the hydraulic fluid pressure on the other side. Basically, I can run that line as far as I want, and the beginning and the end should be exactly the same amount of pressure because you cannot compress hydraulic fluid, water, liquid, whatever you want to put in it. So that's kind of the way we're going to get the measurement from a distance but yet be accurate close up. Um, if you guys have a better idea out there, please throw it to me. But uh, that was kind of Tim's solution and I told Tim I could add a rubber diaphragm in there to keep everything isolated from the gases, from the fluid, liquid, water, whatever we use. Totally isolate the two and uh, that's kind of the solution we're going to be doing. But killing the transducer is because of the high voltage, the frequencies, and the plasma EMF, all that stuff happening in a tiny area and that sensor being next to it just kills it. I've also, um, in my outside lab there, I've got a big TV in the background. Found that on the side of the road, by the way. Use that as a monitor. I have actually killed that thing. It shut off completely. It even could have been from a, a RF frequency coming off the uh, the high voltage plasma feel that's actually hitting the IR remote control button and shutting that TV off. I don't know, but that TV has shut off twice and uh, that's a bad thing. And so I'm throwing off some nasty stuff. So I'm trying to get stuff as far as away from the chamber as I possibly can. Alright, so that's it. I wanted to add those things in there because I forgot to do it. Peace and love. Have a good day. See ya.